Marching on, marching on, for Christ and everything but lost, and to crown him king, toil and sing, meet the banner of the cross. Good, good, good. We're going to open with a word of prayer. As is our custom, we open up the altar. If you'd like to come and pray for God's power on the services, maybe you have a burden, maybe you have a need. Uh, some prayer requests that I'll mention as folks are coming. Uh, we, uh, if you would, continue to be in prayer for Paul Peterson, uh, who's a friend of Ron Path, who's uh, recovering from uh, heart surgery. Heart surgery. Uh, also, if you would, continue to pray for, or pray for Bonnie Mott. Uh, she's in the hospital. I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but we call it, got a call, a message left here. Uh, saying that she went in the hospital sometime yesterday evening, and so be in prayer for her. Just pray for others. Maybe we have some folks that are out with colds. We have a lot of folks traveling. But let's go to God in prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for the great salvation, Lord, of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, paying for our sin, providing salvation for all. Lord, I pray that you would just help us today, Lord, that if there's someone who does not understand salvation, if there's someone today who does not know you as a personal Savior, that today would be the day that they come to know you as Savior. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of having some visitors here today. We pray, Lord, that you just be a blessing to them and encouragement to them. Pray, Lord, for our regulars that you would just also speak to their hearts and challenge them. Lord, we have folks that are sick. We have folks that are in the hospital. We have folks that are out traveling. Lord, we just we have folks that this weekend have had to work because of the holiday. Lord, you know the situations. We ask you to just give uh, grace uh, in every need, for every need. Lord, I pray you to bless all that's said and done today that bring honor and glory to you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you would. And I want to welcome you out this morning to the services. And I uh, have several visitors with us today. It's good to see uh, Dan and Priscilla with us today and uh, in town for the weekend. It's good to see uh, we've got uh, Dave's daughter Jeanette is with us and, uh, and her, her two uh, kids, uh, Toby and Ashlyn, right? And, uh, and uh, Jeanette was in the uh, military, one of those folks that are uh, serving for our nation. We pr- always praise the Lord for that. And then, amen. Yeah, let's see here. We got, and also, is it Arizona, I believe is her name? It came with uh, Dave and Rosie. Good to have her with us today. And then, of course, just a lot, of, all the rest of you. Oh, we got some folks. That's right. John's family is here today. And uh, good to see these folks as well. And then just uh, good to see everyone else out this morning. You never know on a, on a holiday weekend what's going to happen. We have some folks that have to, to work. Uh, we have some folks that are out of town. And then every once in a while we get new visitors in. So you never know what to expect. But I'm glad that you're here. And I'm looking forward to a good day. Uh, we're gonna let me let me share with you a couple uh, quick announcements. Um, we have this Saturday we have the Jamestown Parade. Uh, most years we have a float. This year just for just for things haven't worked out to be able to have a float. But what we're going to do is we're still going to uh, make up some. Uh, we we still have tracks. We still have John and Romans uh, booklets that we can give out. We still have a few things like that. And so what we're going to do and and thank you for those who brought in some candy. We're gonna. Use that to help. Uh, what, some of the things that we do with the candy is not only pass them out at the fair, but we make up candy bags for the, the young people who help us out. And so we're going to use that, put it to good use still with the parade. Uh, but what we're going to do is on Saturday at 1230, we're going to meet at my house. My address is in the bulletin, 409 Spring Street. And what we'll do is we're going to take, I've got 2,000 tracks that I've sorted this week. We've got 600 John and Romans approximately. And uh, we'll divvy them up and we'll just go down and give assign different blocks to different individuals or different people. Lord willing, we'll have 20, 25 people to help us out that day. And uh, we'll just go through. We'll, we'll go to our designated blocks. We'll just start walking through, handing out tracts before the parade starts, give them something to read while they're waiting. And then for the first time in nine years, I'm going to go watch the parade, I think. So, uh, But uh, uh, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll actually have time to do that. And so uh, help us out if you can. We, want, we won't be actually walking in the parade this year. I just take the year off, just, just some complications that we just weren't able to overcome. But, uh, but uh, help, help us if you can with that. Thank you to everybody who helped with the tracks, labeling those tracks. I greatly appreciate it. And I know I saw, I saw one more bag that finished up the, the tracks that came in today. And so thank you for that. Uh, we, so that's coming up on Saturday. Next Sunday we have 
Uh, missionary Alex James will be here in the morning service as well as the evening service. Sunday school, we're going to have a combined class. So all, all teachers, all classes are going to be in here other than the nursery. And uh, we'll have a good time. He'll show his video. We'll have uh, times for questions and answers. He'll sing some songs. His wife, they'll, they'll give some testimony. Uh, he might bring a challenge depending on how many questions we have, if it takes up all the time. And then Sunday night, he'll preach for us. Which brings me to next Sunday night. This is the other pressing thing. Starting in September, we go back to our 6 o'clock evening service on Sunday nights. In the, in the summertime, we bump it to 7. And, uh, but for, from September through uh, April, we go back to 6. And so keep that in mind. And then uh, there's a few other things that are in the bulletin. Just keep in mind with that. And I may mention some of them a little later. But that's good enough for now. All right. Uh, choir, ladies, why don't you come on over and get ready for the choir. Uh, Brother Rogers out of town. His mother turns, I think it's 88. 88 years old this weekend, and so he's up in Erie with her and, and celebrating. And, and uh, so um, I'm going to slide to the, the, the y'all got that? I'm going to slide to the piano and we'll sing a couple songs. Trust me, a blessing to you. We're down a little bit with colds and everything else. Let me, let me get them wherever you need a little bit. Maybe even shift this one just a hair. And uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Actually, move this way just a little bit. That'll work. That, I had to move them that way. They covered up all the ugly faces in the back row. <laughs> all right. I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ paved the, paved the way for me to be able to go to heaven. I'm glad that the old account was settled long ago.
lead us if you would. Turn in your hymn books to number 133. I will sing the wondrous story. 133. We'll stand together, sing the first verse, and then we'll have the uh, choir come down as we shake hands. Standing together, 133. I will sing the blessed, the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. chapter 4, and while you're turning there, let me go ahead and, and sing a special this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever
cross. Uh, Jacob, if you could, could you do something for me? Going on my desk. You wouldn't believe this, but the pastor left his Bible sitting there. i got everything else going on. Just find a Bible, any Bible over there, and, and it'll help me out. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. We're going to be starting here in verse 6, 7, 8, somewhere in there as soon as I get my Bible. That's terrible, isn't it? That, and this is why you ought to show up to church with your Bible. Otherwise, you stand up here looking like the fool because you forgot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mine was a little distracted on everything else going on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 says this, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he has ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I pray you're blessed now as we look at your word. Just give us wisdom and guidance, Lord, to better understand what we have to say. Help us to take and apply these truths, Lord, that we can walk out of here knowing that we're saved, knowing that we're on our way to heaven, knowing that we have a, a Savior in Christ, knowing that we are, are growing. And, and, Lord, knowing that we can uh, be closer to you today than we've ever been before. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We see here in this passage, starting, we've, we've been looking in Ephesians for several weeks now. We went through all three of the first chapters. We started in chapter 4 last week. And he says, in essence, chapter 4 is the more practical aspect of basically, he says, because you understand these truths from chapter 1, 2, and 3, the truths of, of our adoption into the family of God, truths of, of being uh, having an inheritance in Christ, the truths of being redeemed by the blood of Christ, truths of being sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God, truths like being saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast, truths of the fact that, that we as Christians are now part of that church, the body of Christ. He says, because you understand these things, because I've told these things to you, now, therefore, in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the, of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. We looked last week at the fact that we are called of this worthy vocation. We are sa- If we are saved, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have by faith received His gift of salvation, that gift of eternal life. It's not that I'm a good person. It's not that I've been baptized. It's not that I go to church. It's not even that I'm a pastor. That's not what saves me. It's because of Jesus Christ, His shed blood on Calvary, the fact that He willingly gave Himself as our perfect sacrifice and substitute when we realize that He died for our sin, He rose again to conquer sin, death, and the grave, and we call on Him for salvation, believing in Him alone, that is when we're saved. And if we are saved, we now are called, the Bible tells us in in chapter 2, verse 10, it says that we are created unto good works. We have this calling, this vocation, that is a that we are to walk worthy of. We 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 uh, talked about the fact that because of that, it's a it, that calling. The Bible says is a high calling. It, it's not just something of this world. It's not a base thing. It's a it's a heavenly calling. It is of God Himself. It's a holy calling. We we are set apart for His service. And we saw last week that the uh, verses two, three, and uh, two and three dealing with the spirit and attitude of which we are to walk in this vocation. He said in verse 2, with all lowliness. He talked about humility. Humility. And meekness. That inner strength that basically is a controlled temperament 
where we say, I trust that God is working through this situation. Therefore, I will just continue to be faithful and do what I ought to do. That thought of, says, lowliness, meekness with long suffering. Long suffering, where, number one, on one side of the coin, we may face trials. Anybody in here ever face a trial in your life? Yeah, we all face trials in our lives every day. Say, preacher, I, I, I've gone through four just to get here this morning. <laughs> uh, we face trials. And he says, as Christians, let's be long-suffering. Realize, listen, God will get us through these trials. We might face hardship, but let's continue on. But also on the other side of that coin is this. There are, there are situations, and there might be even people, in the context here of a, of a church, there might be situations or people that we need to be long-suffering with, have patience with, and realize that they're still growing. Or you know, we, 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 I'm not going to re-preach everything from last week, but that thought of, you know, the preacher, you don't know how much those people get on my nerves. And, 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 and yet God says, listen, it might just be that, yeah, they're annoying today. Maybe they just don't realize it. Maybe they just don't realize, realize maybe, you know, Sometimes we just have to be long-suffering and say, I'm going to be patient. And the next word here is forbearing one another in love. Forbearing is, I'm going to put up with it. I, I just, even though I rightfully could just say something, Dale, I'm going to put up with it because I know that they just don't understand yet. And, that, and let's face it, we have all been there at some point in time in our life. And we talk about how we, we, as Christians, we mature at different rates. It's just the kids singing songs downstairs and having fun and goofing off. There's no mass murders down there. They're just screaming. I promise. <laughs> I'm not sure what song it is they're singing, but they're singing one of those where they're, ah! So, fun, fun, fun. Uh, uh, I was preaching somewhere along here. Uh, oh, so, so long-suffering, forbearing one another, and we said it's in love. We're talking about when we deal with folks, if we're saved, the way that we walk this, this vocation, the way that we walk worthy, we do it with the spirit of, of humility and realizing, listen, we really aren't anything but for the grace of God. And that could be us that, we, that we're dealing with. Uh, we talk about that thought of, again, of meekness. Where you say, all right, Lord, I trust that you're working in this situation. I'll continue to pray for these, these folks. Uh, that long-suffering and that forbearing. All right, Lord, I'm doing this. Why? Forbearing one another in love. Because we love one another. And the Bible says we ought to love one another. Amen? And so we go on to that. It says that endeavoring, verse 3, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It says we ought to be able to have unity and peace. If we are Christians and we are together, we ought to be able to have unity. We ought to have peace with one another. He goes on in the next few verses and talks about the fact that there's, there's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father, and all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. And just shows even in that, that example of God and his plan that it's all in unity, all working together for the same purpose. So then we come to verse 7. And it says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He says, we are all one. We all have that unity. We all have, we're endeavoring to keep that peace. But he says, in addition to that, though, God also does administer gifts to us. He, he gives us, uh, every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. God, we, we won't turn there for today for sake of time, but in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that God himself, administers to us gifts. Sometimes it's a gift of hospitality, maybe a gift of evangelism, maybe a gift of, uh, of, of servanthood, a gift of a lot of different gifts that they have, gifts and talents that God knows what we need, and he has already determined what kind of... Now, it doesn't mean that if you say, well, I don't have that gift, I guess I, I don't have the gift of, gift of hospitality, so I get to be rude to everybody. No, that doesn't, that's not what that means. What it means is sometimes people are just gifted in the way that where it's just natural for them. You know what I'm talking about? You know, where, where some of us might have to, we'll just use hospitality. Some of us might have to think, okay, now I need to make sure I do this and make sure I offer, offer uh, something, uh, a snack or a drink for the person who's visiting with us and make sure I've got this taken care of. Others, it's like it just comes natural. They, it, you know what I'm talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that, well, I don't have that gift, so, hey, you want something, you should have brought it yourself. You know, it's not like that. It's not that we're rude. It's not that we're mean. We still, as a Christian, work to develop the right kind of Christian traits, but there are some people who are given gifts. And God says that, that he gives these gifts according to the measure uh, of, the, uh, of the gift of Christ. God knows who's going to get what gifts. God knows what gifts they're going to have. And now in the context here in Ephesians, he's going to talk about some gifts that were given to the church. Now notice it says in verse 8, 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, he's introducing the fact in this point that he's giving gifts unto these men, which are going to be in the church. Now, and we're going to pick that up in verse 11. But before we go to verse 11, there are some parentheses there. Notice in verse 9 and 10. And let me just, it it reads funny, but the parentheses are here just to make sure people know who uh, Paul Paul is talking about. Verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, he's going to be talking about Jesus, the fact that Jesus who ascended. In verse 9 and 10, it tells us this. Now that he ascended, now that Christ ascended, what is it but that Christ also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended, Christ, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he, Christ, might fill or fulfill all things. Now, let me just briefly tell you what's going on here. This is just more of a clarification of who it is and what Christ has done. We get a little glimpse of what takes place. And, we, and I, I've done a complete sermon on this before, about a year or so ago. But uh, we see a little glimpse of what took place between Calvary, when he says it is finished, and the resurrection when he comes out of the tomb. What happened was, of course, remember, remember the thief on the cross said, he said, wilt thou remember me? And he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, the Bible gives reference to paradise as, at that time, being the same place called Abraham's bosom. In Luke 16, uh, Jesus tells the, the, uh, the true account of a man named Lazarus and the rich man, and how Lazarus uh, died, and the Bible says was carried to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died, it says, and his eyes lift up, being lifted up in torments, he was in hell. And we see this fact that, that Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, what the Bible also references as paradise, and across this great gulf was the rich man in hell. The rich man at that time looked up and he saw and he said, hey, Father Abraham, will you send Lazarus to come? Just dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue. The pain, the torment is so terrible. And let me just say this, hell is a terrible place. Hell is a place where no one should ever want to go. Hell is a place that God created for the devil, for Satan and his devils. But because of sin, we condemn ourselves there. But thank God that's not the end of the story. Thank God Jesus Christ died on that cross to pay for our sins so we don't have to go to hell. Amen. Now, Jesus says to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He gives up the ghost. It is finished. He then comes and he is, uh, the Bible says in this passage, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. What happened is he comes down to that place of paradise, Abraham's bosom. And the Bible says that he led captivity captive, right there in verse 8. And what happened is, the, the thought is this, that he goes down. The Bible also tells us in another passage that he preached to those that were in hell. And he, in essence, he's telling, number one, as he's speaking and he's preaching to these folks, those that are in paradise, those that are in, in Abraham's bosom, he says, hey, I am the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one, I'm the Messiah that was promised to you, Adam and Eve. I'm the one that, that Abraham, that you knew would come one day as the promised seed. I'm the one, Moses, that you are a type of. I'm the one, Joshua, that you are a type of as, you, as we've looked forward. David, I'm the one who am of your seed. And he could go through, and, and all those Old Testament saints saw and realized Jesus Christ, they knew the Messiah was coming. But he says, I'm him. I'm the one. At the same time, to all those who reject him, they hear, he says, I'm, I am the one. I'm the one who could have saved you. You'd had faith in me. If you would have trusted me, you no longer would have to be. You would not have to be in that torment of hell. And then the Bible says he took this this group and he had brought them to what the Bible references as the third heaven, where God where God in his throne is. And he led captivity captive. That's the phrase that explains that. He took them. Now the Bible says that hell is enlarging upon itself. In essence, that area that was hell that was and then you had hell and then you had had uh, paradise. It's though, as though hell is just getting larger and larger and larger and being filled more and more every day, unfortunately. Why? Because people reject the gift of salvation. But that's what he's talking about. He says that's, that's the Jesus we're talking about, that when he died, he, not, he led captivity captive. He ascended. He says he that ascended, first he had to descend. He descended, and then he brought all those that he might, fulf- that he might fill, or the thought is fulfill all things. Now, 
That's the parentheses there. That's the parenthetical section there. But getting back to verse 8, going into verse 11. Wherefore he saith, let me before I go, does that make sense? I, I hope I explained it. If, you don't, if, if it didn't make sense to you, talk to me later when we can talk a little bit more thoroughly and I can show you some other verses. I just want, to make sure, I just want you to see what that is. Verse 8, Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 11, And he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So, preacher, why would you read all that? That's all one sentence right there. It all relates to each other. He says in verse 8 that he gave gifts unto men. Now, what we're going to see is these gifts that he gave to some men to be a help to this church that we're talking about. The body of Christ. The, the, which is referenced in the very last verse of that passage. He says, first of all, he gave to some men the gift of apostles. Those apostles were there as a gift to the church to teach them early on. Now, Bible, the Bible definition for the apostles would be somebody who had seen Christ or who was a part of Christ's ministry, uh, somebody who, who was called by Christ, the resurrected Christ. And you have men like, you have Peter, you have John, you have James. Those Now, there are a secondary group that are oftentimes referenced as a general apostle, uh, but that, that, that uh, title and that position, if you want to say, of apostleship ended in the first century. It ended with those men as they died out. We haven't seen Christ personally. We haven't seen him in his ministry we, we are not apostles. There are no apostles today. They, the, those folks, but at the time, they were the ones who went out. Remember, they didn't have all the New Testament then. They were writing it. They were living it. And yet those men would go forward and be able to say, hey, listen, let me tell you what Jesus taught us when we were with him for those three years. Let me tell you what the resurrected Christ showed me in those 40 days before he ascended to heaven. Paul could say, let me tell you what God has given me by revelation. The apostles that were there to help that church to grow and to be the right kind of uh, uh, the, the right kind of uh, uh, doctrine and all those things. He said not only that, verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets. Now, a prophet would be somebody would have two two tasks, I guess you could say. One would be to foretell, like giving predicting the future, and then what, the other would be to foretell, in essence, to preach what they were told. Now, you have men like uh, like John, who wrote the book of Revelation under the inspiration of God. He wrote things that were going to happen in future events, things that still have to happen in our future. He was a prophet. Uh, there are men who were prophets and, and were given by revelation of God, by inspiration of God, things to write that would come, that would come true. But not only that, they were prophets in the fact that they were there to preach and to, to tell what God had given them. Now, today, praise the Lord, we have the Word of God, the complete Word of God. We don't need... Somebody to you, you don't need me to get up here and say, well, you know what? God gave me something new today that you don't even need your Bible for this. This is something new that's just like the Bible. If somebody, if a preacher says that, if a preacher says what I have for you is the same as what the Bible says, even though it's not in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm saying adding to, not just, well, here's something that agrees with the Bible. I'm saying, Put your Bibles aside. Let me tell you something that God gave me as direct revelation that you won't find in your Bible, but it's just like the Bible. If somebody says that to you, run. Watch out. I'm serious. I'm, because they are going to tell you something they're adding to this book right here. And, and if we allow... Listen, that's, that's where cults come from. That's where cults come from. This is our, 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 our manual for life. Now, they had apostles, they had prophets. We don't need prophets today because we have the complete word of God. When Paul, Paul could be considered a prophet in the fact that God gave him a message and whether it be through preaching or through print, he told the folks what God's message was for them. But today, I don't have to have a new message. I can give you what God gave Paul. Y'all with me? 
So we don't need apostles today. We don't need prophets today. But it also goes on and says evangelists. Now, we do have evangelists today. Evangelists, again, another person that is of a, a, a gift to the church. And you can look at evangelists in, in several different ways. There are evangelists who are church planters. They go to a new area. They preach the gospel. They find and they organize a church. Then they move to the next place. Give that off to a pastor. There are those who do that. There are evangelists who will go and uh, who will, uh, for example, in the end of September, we have Alan Farley coming. Uh, Alan Farley, who's been a great friend of our church for years and years and years, has a very unique ministry. He works with reenactors, uh, the reenact- reenactors' missions for Jesus Christ. And what he does is, is you know, all these different reenactments all across the, the, the Civil War reenactments all across our country. He will go, and on Saturday night and Sunday mornings, he will set up a, a tent for gospel preaching. And depending on his time slot, he will preach a gospel message to folks who never or rarely or maybe never go to church. But they'll go to a reenactment, and they say, oh, this is going to be a service just like they had there in the... In, in the Civil War, I want to go see what that's about. And he opens up the Bible and lets it fly, and he preaches. And week after week after week, he'll have people saved. Now, he does that, but he also goes to churches. He'll go to a church, and he'll preach. And he'll, he'll, he'll preach uh, and to encourage the people, encourage the pastor. Those are evangelists that are given to help the church. Then we see, it says, pastors is the next one. And pastors are the greatest thing. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, pastors... Uh, are those that are given, that are given to specifically each local church to help as a shepherd, to to help shepherd those sheep, to shepherd the flock who are there to help organize the church. Uh, they they they're given three different terms in the Bible: elder, bishop, pastor, all the same all the same uh, position, but they are there to help. I I almost liken it as as a father to the family. There as an under-shepherd to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And thank the Lord I have the privilege to be a pastor. I thank God for it. And then teachers. And there are some who will couple pastors and teachers in this. There are others who put them separately. I believe it's separately because this is the only time it, it, it doesn't ever... Uh, there are references to pastors and teachers separately all throughout the New Testament as though they are two separate uh, things. And listen, we have been given... In our church, we've been given some men and some ladies who have great abilities as teachers. And we all work together. We all work together to help benefit the church. How is that? Verse 12. It says that he gave these, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, understand this. We're not talking about sinless perfection. That's talking about to mature us, to help us to grow, to help us. Hey, Brother Andrew, can you, can you bring one of those uh, things and turn these things up to about 70? I just noticed we've got people huddling and that are cold. These things are hard to, to do. And if, and if everybody's worried about being cold, nobody's going to listen to the preaching. I, I was looking, I thought, there's nobody in that row. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute, just put that about 70. I forgot, I, I usually try to cool it off in here before we get started, and then I try to bump it up, and I just forgot to do so. Thank you, sir. It won't help you in the next 20 minutes, but, but it makes me look good. Amen. <laughs> no, uh, I'm just teasing. Uh, verse, verse, it says, for the perfecting of saints, in essence, the maturing for the maturing process of the saints, to help us to grow. It says he gave us pastors, he gave us teachers, he gave us evangelists to help us to grow, to help us to become a, a better Christian uh, for the work of the ministry. Why do we need to be better Christians? So that we can do the work that God has called us to do. And, and what will that do? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Now the body of Christ is the church. To help build us up, to help us to grow, to help strengthen us. He says... We, these, these men, these evangelists, these pastors, these teachers, these positions were given to help the church in their, mature, in their maturing and in their, to help them as they do the work. Verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, two ways you can look at this, this thought here, and I think either one will apply. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. In essence, As a pastor, part of my job is to continue to teach and to preach the Word of God so that for for your maturing process, for the perfecting of the saints, until we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, what is the faith? That's what's found right here in this book. And so my job is to to teach this in a way that that Jacob begins to understand it. Wow, okay, 
I see this. And as he agrees with this, he's in agreement with Caroline because she's in agreement with this. Not that they agree with each other separately from this, but that he agrees with this and she agrees with this. And that she would agree. So if she agrees with this, then they're in unity. And if he agrees with this, then they're all in unity, etc., etc. And part of the job and the privilege of a pastor and these men, here, these evangelists and, and teachers, is to help us to get to the place where we come in the unity of the faith. It says, end of the knowledge of the Son of God, to help us understand who Christ is and what he's done for us, salvation, etc. Uh, unto a perfect man, that thought of being uh, matured as a Christian, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you can look at that and say, just like it says in Romans 8, 29, that we are being conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, you can look at that in the temporal realm of saying we are all here for us to become closer and closer and more mature and more mature and get as far as we can in this realm. Or you can also look at it and say that we are here until to keep teaching and to keep preaching and keep helping to grow until we get to heaven. Because when we get to heaven, guess what? We will be in unity of the faith. We will have a full knowledge of the Son of God. When we get to heaven, we will be complete and perfect. When we get to heaven, we will have the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We will have that glorified body. So whether you look at it to say practically here today that we are here to help us to get better and better and better and better and better and to grow more and more in our walk with Christ, or you can say, I'm here until you die and get to heaven and God fixes the rest. Either way, it applies goes on to say this, verse 14. Why, do, why is this important? Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now here's a problem that they had in Ephesus. Here's a problem that we have today. There are people out there that are trying to teach contrary to this word. Many people, whether it's done ignorantly or intentionally, there are people teaching contrary to this word. And he says, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, these men, these folks are given to the church to help them to grow, to mature, so that they aren't like little kids just following any kind of uh, word that's said. Now, would you all agree, we could probably take a little kid and convince them just about anything. They're, They're... If it's somebody that's trustworthy, we could convince them of just about anything because they're gullible, right? They're kids. They're kids. You could convince, if you really wanted to, you could convince somebody that that something that is red is blue if you wanted to. I remember, this is just a silly illustration, but it applies. We had some friends. They had a little, their baby, probably about one, one and a half, two years old. One day it was just, they, they wanted this cup. But the cup that was given to them was this cup. I don't want that cup. I want that cup. It was it was at a, we were at a, at a dinner. Two two cups identical cups, you know, plastic or styrofoam, you know. No, I don't want that. I want that cup. Finally, I think just to get the kid to shut up. The dad went said Okay, here you go. Put the same cup down. Did, did this with his hands. Put the same cup down that the kid already had, and the kid said, good. Now, that kid did not get a different cup. That kid got the same exact cup. But they were convinced. They were tricked that easily. Now, if I did that to you adults, you'd be like, what are you trying to pull? That's the same cup. But children are that way. They can be easily misled, easily swayed. Spiritually speaking, if we don't grow. Listen, I've I've talked with people that they get saved, they're they're young in Christ, or maybe they've been saved a while, but they just don't go to church, they don't grow, they haven't learned, and they come up with some of the craziest things. And I'll say, where did you hear that? Well, I heard this guy on TV. Or, well, you know, I I remember one time somebody was telling me how he said, I I just know that, you know, I I just love how God, if if I put a dollar in, he's going to give me $10. I said, where would you get that? He said, because the Bible talks about 10% and stuff. You know, if I give 10, you know, he had the whole thing messed up. And I said, actually, it's not not how it works. I wish it worked like that. You know, it's not how it works. You know, and and, and I've, I've heard people say, well, but my grandma taught me this. And so it must be true, but it doesn't go along with the Bible. You know. 
And if we're not careful as young Christians, if we don't take the time to feed on the Word of God, if we don't take the time to grow, we can be carried about with every wind of doctrine. The thought is this, like of, of a storm that comes up on a ship. Tossed to and fro. You know, when that storm starts, that ship starts to rock a little bit. It does, it's, not, it's not that it's perfectly calm and then all of a sudden a, a hundred foot wave hits them. It starts to build up. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. It says, by the slight of men. Think about it, that thought of, you know, you know, you know like in, in magic tricks, those illusions, where they use a sleight of hand and they trick you because of what they've done. He says, there are people out there who are trying to trick you with that deception, that fraud. They use this by the slight of men. It says going on, it says, and cunning craftiness. I thought of thought of cunning craftiness would be like the same same thought, same principle that was given there in, in uh, Genesis about the serpent being the most subtle creature and how the devil came and he tricked Eve. That cunning craftiness. Oh, I I, I can I know how to get them. I know how to do this. It says there are going to be preachers and teachers out there that are going to try to teach false doctrine. If these folks don't get themselves strengthened and growing through the church, through these, these pastors and teachers, evangelists. It says, they may fall prey to those that are with, by the slight of men, by cunning craftiness. It says, whereby they lie in wait. Think about that. Just the thought, of, just the, the terms itself, to lie in wait. You can see as though it's a, it's a predator waiting to pounce on the prey. And that's what they're trying to do. And he says, because of that, it says, lie, lie in wait to do what? To deceive. To deceive. Uh, I'll give you some examples real quick. Real quick. How many of you have ever seen on on TV those commercials where you have it shows it talks about how the importance of a, a good family, a good home, it talks about having a, a faith in God, all these different things, and they show they, they, they show all these these pictures of, of nice families and all these things, and at the very and they and everything they say is everything that we as Christians would believe until they get to the end and they say, and that's why you ought to find out more about the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, which is the Mormons. They'll say, hey, you, not necessarily in the commercials, but you can look and you can say, well, look at all these Mormons and their great, the, the great businesses that they do and how successful they are and how wonderful things are. And let me just stop and say this. You know why a Mormon can have, uh, whether, whether it's a Christian, a Mormon, whether it's somebody who, who, who would never ever even call the name of God in any way other than a swear word, if they use biblical principles in business, guess what? They'll be successful because biblical principles are always biblical principles. But they'll say, oh, see, we have good homes, we have good businesses. You ought to, ought to find out more about us. And they very, with, with sleight of men, very cunning, they say, come to get to know us a little bit. And next thing you know, in time, they don't tell you right off the bat, well, you know that Jesus is not really God, he's just a God, and he was the brother of Satan, and they were both gods. And if we, if we join the Mormon church and we live a good life, uh, then we'll be, become gods eventually too. They don't tell you that, because most people would say, uh, this doesn't sound right to me. What they do is they start off with a little bit here, a little bit there, to the point where they get you in. Next thing you know, they've taken somebody who doesn't know the word of God, and they've taught them false doctrine to the point they say, oh, Okay, well, makes sense. Jehovah's Witnesses knock on the door. They don't say, you know, Jesus isn't really God. Now, that's what they believe. But they'll say, hey, would you like to have a Bible? Could we come by? We'd love to have a Bible study with you. Now, who are the people that, now, the people who don't want anything to do with God, they're going to be like, get out of here. The people who are grounded in the Word of God would say, listen, we, I, I already know what I believe. Jesus Christ. God the Son in the, in the flesh. He was our sacrifice. He died on the cross to pay for our sin. He rose from the dead. He's alive today. He's seated at the Father's hand. He's coming back to get us. You know, we, they, they, we're not going to listen to him because we, we have what the Bible tells us. But those who have some idea, oh, I'd like to know more about the Bible. But they're not grounded. Let's have a Bible study. Okay, that sounds great. And they bring in, now you'll notice, hopefully you don't see this because hopefully you don't have them in your house. But they'll show up with their Bible and they'll put the Bible here, and they'll bring out their books and magazines and say, now notice what this says. And they're not going to the Bible unless it's something to reference. They'll take a verse out of context to reference their teaching. And next thing you know, they will eventually have taught you that there is no 
real heaven. There is, Jesus isn't really God. And they'll teach you all kinds of false doctrines. But those people who aren't grounded in the Word will fall prey to that. Now, say, so well, preacher, are you here bashing those people? No, those people are people who have been misled, mistaught, who need to hear the truth. We need to love them. We need to pray for them. They need to understand. Unfortunately, very many of them have been, have been tossed to and fro, carried about by wind of doctrine, false doctrine, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And they've been caught up with it. And all they know is what they've been told, which is an error to the Word of God. But let's face it, if we don't take time to study and learn the Word of God, how are we going to know if something's an error or not? That's why it's so important to be a part of the local church. That's why it's so important to have a pastor. That's why it's so important to have these, these teachers and these evangelists that help us. Going on to verse 15 and 16. We'll be done here in just a minute. Instead of these thoughts of, of, of slight of men and cunning craftiness and deceiving, he says, rather, these men are there, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. He says, the pastors that we have, the teachers that we have, the evangelists that we have, and in their, and in their time, the apostles and prophets were given not so these folks would be able to grow, understand the Word of God, have a better knowledge, become more mature, that they wouldn't be tossed uh, to and fro, that they wouldn't be deceived, but rather, by them speaking the truth in love, it would help them to grow up and mature, and grow up in all things, it says, which is the head, even Christ. And basically, we are there to help you to become more like Christ. To understand the truths of the Word, to become more like Christ. And he says in verse 16 then, uh, at it being tagged on to Christ, says, from whom? Christ. The whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And what he does, he's giving us a picture. And the Bible tells us in chapter 5, it's going to tell us about that, that even spell it out more clearly, Christ is the head, and we, the local church, we who are saved, born again, are part of the body of Christ. And so, he says, we are, the church has been given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to help us to grow, to help us to understand, to help us to mature, to help us become more like Christ, to not be carried away by false doctrine, but to help grow us up into Him. And He is the head, and we are the body. Those joints, where it talks about the, the, the joints uh, uh, compacted uh, that, by that which every joint supplieth, etc. Where we as a body are working together in accordance to the head in order to, the last part of verse 16, make increase of the body, to build us up, to grow us, Unto the edifying, again, building us up, developing us, maturing us, uh, edifying of itself in love. So here's what he says. My job as your pastor is to teach you and to preach to you the Word of God, to help you to grow, to help you become a better Christian, a stronger Christian, to, to be able to walk worthy of the vocation that where with your call, so that way you don't say, oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. And so you can say, wait, that's not according to the Bible. That's wrong. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Let me just stop and say this. The best way to know that something is wrong is not to study every wrong thing, but to be determined and focused on what is right. And if you know what's right, then you're gonna, nobody's going to be able to convince you otherwise. What is this right here? A chair. If I told you it was a table, you don't have to study. You don't have to say, well, maybe it is a table. Let me study every kind of table that's ever been made so I can find out does that fit as a table. No, you know it's a chair. So if I tell you if it's a table, you're like, Preacher, you're nuts. You're lying to me. That's not a table. That's a chair. We don't have to study every kind of table that's ever been built to determine that that's a chair. We know it's a chair. Therefore, we can say, you're wrong. We don't have to study every... Now, it doesn't hurt us to find out about some of these things of other, other false teaching. But if we know what is right, and I say, and you know that this is a chair, and I say, no, it's a table, you say... You're wrong. I'm not listening to you. I know what this is. Now, he says we teach you that to build you up so that your body works in accordance with the head to build us up and edify us in love. And 
again, we see that thought of that love that we are to have together. Now here's, it'll get more into the, the head and, and things about that, but just basic common sense, we'll be done. The head, the brain, is what tells the rest of the body what to do, correct? The reason my hand is moving is because my brain is telling my hand to move. Now, if in, in people, if, if, if my head says, move your hand, but my hands cannot move, they cannot move, or my, my, my mind says to my legs, you need to move, but they cannot move, there's a handicap. There's a, something's crippled. Something is, is, is not right. We would say there's, there's no connection. Something's wrong with the connection from here to here. We're paralyzed. One of the reasons why churches struggle today is because they are paralyzed in the fact that the head says, do this. And the body says, I don't hear anything. Or, I hear it, but I'm not, I can't do it. They're paralyzed. They're not doing the things that God would have them to do. Because they're not following the head. Now, if we understand, and part of the reason you have a pastor, according to this pastor, is to teach you that he is the head. And we as the body are to do as he commands. And to do what he expects of us. And to build us up, to strengthen us. Why? Because the stronger we are, the more effective we are in doing what the head wants us to do. Last illustration, and we're done. On Monday, Brother Rocky and I went up to Ashtabula. There's some friends of ours up at Lighthouse Baptist up there. They were playing men's basketball. And Brother Rocky said, hey, you want to go play basketball? I said, yeah, let's go. So we went to play basketball. And we survived. And in fact, I, 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 I'll be honest, I hadn't, other than for that, what, 10 minutes that it took us to score about three points when we were at the picnic the other day, I hadn't played basketball in months and months and months, and I hardly played it all last year. And I didn't do too bad for the fact that I hadn't played for months and months and months, etc. But I'll be honest, there was a moment I saw the ball, a guy shot it, it hit the rim, and my mind said, jump and get that rebound. And my body said, who are you talking to? (laughs) And by the time my body said, oh, me, I went, and the ball was gone. And... There's another time I got the ball. I, no, I, haven't, I haven't played it. And my hands just, I haven't been gripping a basketball in a while. I got the ball. I turned like this to go up. And the ball slipped right up. I, just, just in this momentum. And the ball's gone out of bounds. You know what? Because I hadn't done Quit laughing, Dale. They, you and me on the basketball court later, okay? I, I'm sure I can take you. I hope. Uh, I hope. Uh, <laughs> what happened? I haven't strengthened this body for basketball a long time. When I was 20, I lifted weights. You can tell already. Uh, I lifted weights. I ran. I did all kinds. I exercised. I was out playing basketball all the time. And I was far more effective when I strengthened myself for the task. Now, if I get out there and I don't kill myself, it's been a good night. I'm not strengthened. We are more effective as we strengthen ourselves. And the church has been given men like pastors, folks that are teachers, evangelists, to help strengthen us. Why? Because we need to understand what this book says. If we don't understand what this book says, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. Because there are people out there. And they, like I said, whether it's done in ignorance, they've never been taught otherwise, they don't know this book, or done out of just plain, um, just plain deception, they are leading people astray every single day. Folks, we need to get close to this. We need to understand that there are doctrines like salvation by grace through faith. But the Bible says, as opposed to saying, well, you get saved if you're a good person. Well, if at the end of your life your good deeds outweighed your bad, you're okay. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works the same as should boast. There are folks who say, well, listen, you can just, you're saved, you're good, live however you want to live. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that 
say, well, we have liberty in Christ. They don't understand what liberty in Christ is. We, we live under grace, yes, but do we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, the Bible says. We live holy lives. But if you don't study the Bible, you don't know these things. Thank God for pastors and teachers and evangelists. And in their day, apostles and prophets to teach, to expound the Word of God. We can better understand. As we stand together, heads bowed. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to preach, to share these truths. Lord, take this last 30, 35 minutes to just show you, show these folks what the Bible has to say. Lord, I pray that you would help us to realize the importance of the local church, the importance of being in the church so that we can hear the, the preaching and the teaching to help us to grow and to help us to be a better Christian, to help us to, to be uh, more like Christ. Lord, that we would understand that there are those out there trying to deceive us. Lord, it might be today that there's somebody, maybe, maybe they just, they didn't realize it. Maybe they've, They've been listening to somebody else that's been teaching false doctrine. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to see it and understand it. Lord, it might be that there's somebody today, maybe they've been, they've been told their life, well, as long as you're a good person, you can get to heaven. Brother Brad and I were discussing a gentleman that he talked with just the other night. He said, oh, I'm going to heaven. He said, because I'm a really good person. I do good things for people. And yet, Lord, as he showed him the Word of God, that it said it's not of works. It's only by your grace through faith. Lord, the gentleman didn't even want to hear it. He said, well, I, I should be okay. And yet, Lord, that's just one of the lies of the devil. Maybe there's someone here today who's never been saved. I pray that you'd allow them to just come and, and speak with us. Allow us to show them from your word how they can know for sure they're on their way to heaven. Maybe there's somebody here today, Lord, that you just need to strengthen and encourage. Whatever it might be, Lord, I pray as we have this invitation time, we just do business with you. Maybe you've been speaking to the heart about another matter that we didn't even talk about today. Lord, whatever it might be, as we use this altar for time with you, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, music begins to play. If you need to come and use the altar, why don't you come now? We'll have one who's coming for baptism in a few moments. He, he can come right up this way and get ready in that room. And we'll do that in just a few minutes. But if you're here today, God's dealing with your heart, why don't you come? Why don't you come? I'm going to ask Brother Jacob to come up here and help us out uh, with, with the song. What number is that, Miss Sherry? Number 62 in your hymna, hymnal. If you'd like to turn there just as I am. And if you, if you need to come and be saved, why don't you come? If you're here, God's dealing with your heart about a matter. The altar's open. We, won't, we, don't, we don't twist arms and get people to come forward. We just want to make it available to you. But as we sing, God's leading in your heart, leading your life. Why don't you come and do business with Him? As we sing, number 62, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I Yeah.
ました。